is that our faith in God, our faith in this thing called the Scriptures, is constantly being reaffirmed. And so this gentleman, through his scholarship, partnering with some astrological and astronomical uh, scholars has determined, they figured out what it was that stood over Bethlehem that night. At least they formulated this idea that it was probably a comet. And it's just fascinating that because, see, there's reason and logic in our universe. I know that we live in a time that seems very chaotic. But it's amazing as he sort of goes through this hour and a half conversation, and we're just going to play just a couple minutes of it, where astronomers can actually look at a point in the sky today, and because of knowing things about how we travel around the sun, all these amazing calculations, they can actually go back thousands of years and to see things that sort of can affirm this. And so this is one of these things where we read the story at Christmas time, and I'm going to read the scripture here in just a moment, but I want you just to hear uh, the this, this scholar's understanding of that amazing uh, part of the Christmas story. This stuff, you know, uh, it's very hard for us to get our heads around this, but we need to understand this is history, this is true. Well, so, okay, uh, so let's go back. You, you say that the, the, the Magi have been following the star. They came from where? Some place in Iraq? Most, most probably Babylon. Babylon was really the the NASA, if you want, of the ancient world, uh, NASA. Yeah, I'm trying to put it in American terms. Uh, you know, it's, it's the NASA of the ancient world uh, in control. They have records going back to you know the 8th century or beyond BC. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, records of, of uh, astronomical phenomena. Uh, you know, we have uh, records of leftovers of some of those uh, today. So we, we know a good bit about it, and it was famed throughout the ancient world, Babylonian. Astronomy. And how far would the trip take, I think you write about this in the book, from Babylon to Bethlehem or to Jerusalem? It, I mean, as a crow flies, it's about 550 miles. Okay, but they weren't riding a crow. So this would have taken them how long with camels and that kind of thing? Well, a, 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 camel, a camel caravan travels at approximately the speed of a human walking because usually a human is leading the, the lead camel. So uh, three miles an hour, yeah, yeah two, two to three miles an hour, uh, and depending on terrain also, obviously. So you were expecting it to take something in the range of a month, uh, give or take a little. Okay, so they traveled for a month to see this Messiah. So clearly, whatever they witnessed, astrologically speaking, is huge. They well, no, it's a, it's a huge, you make a very good point, because, uh, you know, we're so used to the kind of, nice Christmas story where it, it almost doesn't, it lacks the reality and the, and the grit of history. These are real astrologers and astronomers who spend their lives observing the stars. Yeah. Uh, every day they're keeping records. Uh, they're also doing astrology where they're people that come in to get their feet and they're accessing their records to answer these questions. And But, but in this case, in other words, they're saying that the stars have told them that a great king has been yeah. born. A I'm king not the great king, I'm just the Messiah, the Jewish king. The Jewish Messiah. So they, even though they're in Babylon, they care about this? What sense do they have about the Jews and the Jewish Messiah? Oh, exactly. Well, this is 50 miles away. Well, this is part of the, a key part of the, the, the mystery. Because here they come from Babylon asking the Jews, they come to Judea and ask the Jews, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? So they've interpreted uh, interpreted what they've seen in the eastern sky to be an actual uh, sign of the Messiah's birth. And they're so confident about this, they actually come expecting to find a newborn Messiah. So whatever they've seen has obviously been deeply impacted, has shaken their world and led them to do something which uh, was really extraordinary. Okay, but, but in Babylon, astrologers would have had a sense of the Jewish Messiah, would have understood that the Jews are awaiting the Messiah? We know from Tacitus uh, that there was a broad expectation within the ancient, broad, broad knowledge in the ancient uh, world, and the ancient Near East, of messianic expectation. And, and so it, does, it, it raises the question, what did they see? And that is really, strangely enough, a question that not many people ask. I was going to say, I never asked that uh, until I watched the 2007 DVD 
uh, which fooled me, um, and until I read your book, to see how complex it is, that there's so many things in the text that have to be reconciled, and it's effectively impossible to do, except I think that you've done it, but, but, did it uh, through his scholarship. I know it's just one scholar, but it's amazing to me that 2,000 years since that story took place that we can actually learn more about it. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited because it just means that my faith is even more valid than the things I believe. It's not something willy-nilly, which means that the hope that we have, the hope that each one of us have in our lives to other people, that's why you're taking this card and putting somebody's name on it that needs to be here on Christmas Eve it needs to happen. Seriously, because there's a hope that we have in the midst of the messiness of just this, again, this last week, realizing that today is National Refugee Sunday, where the, literally 10,000 churches again are trying to pay attention to the fact that there are 13 million people who are displaced because of wars in their home countries of Syria. And that's just one incident. And yet, even though we know that lives are lost, we know that there's a larger story, and we know that there's a purpose in our lives. And you may be, in some regards, like we learned a couple weeks ago, it took Elizabeth and her journey as the mother of John the Baptist, it took her seven years to come to understanding what God was calling her to be and do. And so I want us to wrestle through that this morning as we sort of think about this amazing thing that, that uh, is this sort of, this idea of the star. And the fact that, that through the scholarship we're reminded that there's a whole story taking place. In fact, it's kind of interesting in this that astrologically, um, you sort of know that the, one of the signs of the astrology calendar is Virgo. Well, this, what's really interesting is you pour through this amazing book in his scholarship is that as they've gone backwards, that in the heavens, what the, what the wise men were looking at was actually a comet that appeared within the constellation of Virgo, who is the virgin, and literally the comet appeared in her as, as giving birth. That literally as they were watching us, so they knew these things. And we don't see it because we're too busy. We don't see it because we don't stop and listen. And yet, as you were reminded by how long did it take? I mean, as a crow flies, he said, 550 miles. Well, they weren't riding crows, right, as, as uh, uh, Eric said. No, they actually were on camels. It took them a month. But we need to know that they were actually looking at these stars aligning and coming together. And this isn't something that's sort of like necromancer, sort of Harry Potter kind of weird stuff. No, this is the idea that our God, who created the heavens, actually used the stars to tell his story, because that's the kind of God he is. And my encouragement to each one of us here this morning is that if he's going to pay that kind of detail to just the stars in the heavens, how much more does he pay detail to each one of us? That's crazy. That's crazy that the God of the universe, who we will celebrate in a couple days, uh, just 12 days from now, coming, becoming flesh, walking amongst us, actually, that's crazy that he would stop, that the God of the universe would take on flesh, move into the neighborhood to love me, to love you. I mean, that's the gospel story. That's the promise that we each have to offer each other. But there's these myths, and so this morning, I just wanted to help us unpack that just a little bit, because I want us to get a clear story. So let me just read the scripture. I don't have it all there in your handout, but let me just read the, the chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. In, for out of your, you will come a ruler, you who will shepherd my people Israel. And then King Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them, the exact time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. 
And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Listen to these words. Listen to the words and the story of people who aren't even Christ followers. But because they, they were reasonable and wise men, they actually watched and they listened and they paused in their busyness. And so the theme this morning is, you know, what do you hear? What do you see? But more importantly, what are you listening for? What are you listening for? And it's interesting, as we read this story, that's it. We, uh, we don't get any names. We don't get any camels. And we've sort of learned that we don't even get kings. And if we would read the King James Version, the authorized version, we'll find out it doesn't even say magi. It just says wise men. And it's not even capitalized. God had been silent for well over 400 years. We knew because we were listening, in a sense. My job, my job was to listen. You wouldn't call a person that talks a lot a wise man, would you? No. We may call them many, many, many things, but a wise man wouldn't be one of them. My position was to look for signs everywhere. I read one time about a star that would announce a new king. And then one day, there it was, a bright beacon in the night. A star unlike any star that I'd ever seen before. This must be the star that the Jews had been looking for. The star foretold in their ancient scripture the star of the Messiah. And so, I followed it. There were several of us, and yes, we followed that star. It was bizarre. It led us, it moved, and we follow. Our journey took over two years. And it first led us to Jerusalem. It was there that we met Herod. He claimed that he also wanted to worship the Messiah. He asked us, no, really he demanded that once we found the newborn, we were to return and tell him. We were warned in a dream not to trust this guy. We listened. The star continued, and it took us to Judea. And then the star stopped. The star just stopped shining down on this small cottage. A journey that started to find a, a place fit for a king, a palace fit for a king, ended with a home of a peasant. This was it. 
I mean, this was it. I mean, we gathered our thoughts, we gathered our gifts, we tried to get our emotions. Behind those doors was a king. A king that could command the movement of the stars in the sky, yet came to dwell with us. A king who spoke, and the word became flesh. God was silent no more. That night we knelt. We bowed down to that baby boy. Each one of us laid gifts at his feet. We had to. We had to. Four hundred years of silence, broken by the cries of the Son of God. God, we're, we're just awestruck, literally, as we look at the stars and are reminded of your amazing grace. And so this morning, as we just push into this amazing story one more time, we just pray that our ears would be open. And that our ears would be open so that we could listen. We could listen for what you have to say for, to each one of us, what you have to say to each of us as a corporate body called Linden Road Presbyterian, what you have for your church, the greater church, to make an impact in a world that's broken, a word, world that isn't much different than the world you came into. And so we just pray your love and your Holy Spirit to guide us in these remaining moments this morning to encourage us for all that you've done for us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I mean, a couple thoughts here, your handout. The, the Magi were men who were wise. They weren't necessarily wise men. Um, and the thing is, they had been listening and waiting. Listening and waiting. And when you hear the story that they had been waiting some 400 years, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. But you see, we find that this, the birth of the event of Jesus Christ was also something that was long time coming. And to be honest, as the men have gathered on Thursday, and this is just a plug for here free Thursday for lunch, uh, we've got one more week, and then we, uh, we're going to take a couple weeks off for Christmas. But uh, there is the opportunity. We're worship, working through the book of Genesis. And it's just been interesting to go back and realize that even in the fall, even in the, in the very cursing of our, the ground we have to work on, that God was providing a way, that God was providing hope. But for us as Christ followers, really, Advent, the season that we're in, is all about listening. It's really about waiting. In fact, to be technical, Christmas doesn't start until the 25th. That on the church calendar, we are actually in that season called Advent, where we're waiting with expectation of what God's going to do. The retelling of this amazing story. And you've all done long road trips. I mean, can you imagine doing a road trip for a month? I mean, I can remember one trip I did in particular with a group of college students in 92 to the Houston Republican Convention. And it was the road trip from, yeah, Hades. <laughs> and it took us 24 hours to get from Columbus, Ohio to Houston. And I remember we stopped halfway in Memphis to change bus drivers. I don't know whether we wore him out <laughs> or the bus was, you know. But it's this idea, we've all been there, right? Long journeys. And it's like, this is kind of crazy stuff. Uh, I mean, in fact, think about it just for a moment. What's the longest journey that you've taken? And when you think about, as we heard in the monologue, the fact that these men were looking for years, literally. And this trip took them literally a month of journeying to get to this thing. They weren't even sure where they were going, in some sense. And then if you even think of the obstacles that came in their way and how, how Herod almost sort of compromised the whole trip. And yet God, even though they were Babylonians, even though they were men who were not Christ followers, God spoke to them and kept them safe because of the story that God is writing for each one of us. How about this? I mean, uh, we all look for signs, right? I mean, especially right now, uh, 
Did you ever get that first parking space right by the mall, the supermarket, and think it was a sign? It's like, yes, yes. Uh, or, uh, you know, did you ever, uh, these ideas that we're willing to see things around us as signs of God, but then we also demand them from God, too, right? I mean, there's this idea, okay, I'm going to, I can remember as a young boy, I wanted to go on a scout retreat, <laughs> scout retreat for the weekend, and it's like, okay, I needed to get an A on my science test on Friday to be able to leave after school because that's what my mom said. And so my prayer, even though I hadn't done the studying, so this tells you where I'm going, it's like, okay, God, I know I didn't do the studying, but if you really want me to go, you got to give me an A on this test so I can go. It'll be a sign from you. Well, I stayed home that weekend because I hadn't done my part. I hadn't done my part. And there are these moments aren't, where each of us sort of go, you know, God, if you're really up there and you love me, please uh, get, just give me a sign. And then, you know, you just sort of wait. You know, just wait a long pause. And the tension is for us as Christ followers is that, is that we need to pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on us. It's that tension of trying to figure out what it means. It's interesting, the, the wise man said, we gathered our thoughts and we gathered our gifts. You know, it reminded me of sort of like when we go to grandma's house uh, or that house that you go to for Christmas Eve, you know? I mean, there's a lot of last minute instructions, right? A lot of, if you've got kids, a lot of hair brushing, teeth brushing, you know, get the right clothes, all that. Uh, a lot of repairs, maybe to packages because it got torn or something as you were loading it into the car. And we do that because we know that what's inside that house we're going to is Christmas. We're going there with that expectation. But I want us to be reminded that, you know, God chose to be here with us. That if we go back and read that story in Genesis, he could have just left it all a mess, and he didn't. That even in the very cursing, in the very cursing of the serpent and the, of the fact that the woman would have child pain in childbirth, God makes a promise that someday... Someday. And for us as Christ followers, we look back to that day. That's why we have a cross. To be reminded that Christ died for us. And that if that didn't take place, that that baby that was born in the manger didn't hang on that cross, and more importantly, didn't raise from the dead, that all that we have to hope for in the future is actually in vain. And again, my favorite scripture is this one. I just love this version from Peterson. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes and the one-of-a-kind glory like the Father, like the Son, who is generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John 1.14. It's interesting that he chose the word, word, literally, because the word becomes real. When God created the universe, he does the same thing, if you remember. He says, let there be light. God speaks the universe into existence. And as we know, as we read, particularly in John's Gospel, that Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. God speaks again, and we get Jesus. How, how cool is that? God speaks, and the universe comes into existence. And he speaks again, and we get Jesus. But, you know, the reality in our lives is this, is that God was finished with being silent. And that's the hope that we take. That God no longer is silent. And in fact, now it's become a little more interesting because Jesus, as we learn in Pentecost, leaves, sends his Holy Spirit. In fact, he says to his, his followers, I've got to get out of here so the Holy Spirit can come and empower you. And not only empower them, but empower each one of us. Each one of us to be something more. Something more that he desires for us. Something more that he wants us to understand. Something more that he wants us to lean into. Because it's complicated. Our lives are complicated. Our lives are hard. But you see, this thing called communication, really it's about listening to each other. And that's the piece that Advent is supposed to help us do. So even like yesterday or Friday night, those of us that were here for the Nativity Tour, it was just kind of fun to listen to people. To listen to the memories that they had. Had a good friend who stopped yesterday who I haven't seen in a while and we have close ties with the family, and, and this one particular individual is pushing through Alzheimer's. And it was just, just interesting, their connection to this literal space, to being reminded of, of family members who were here many, many years ago. 
And even this morning, I, I, I was encouraged by a, a short missive from the daughter who just said, uh, thank you. Thank you for what this church is doing in the community. And thank you for doing the nativity tour because it was very good for my mother. It was very healing for her. And even as they pulled out of the driveway, she said, there were moments that were brought back to her as she's now, you know, and that's a tension that we all have to sort of eventually face, isn't it? Being reminded of, of this thing called maturing. I mean, too often when, while someone is speaking, we are already thinking about what's coming up next. We're, we're, instead of really listening. So some questions for you to ponder. What are we being silent about? What have we buried deep down within ourselves and we have a refusal, a refusal to say? Are there things that we need to speak up about? Is it time to speak those words after being silent for so long? Is it time to change our world? The brokenness that exists in our culture. And to realize that the only way we're going to understand that for each of us is to be in a prayerful understanding. But my question to sort of help us wrestle through these next remaining days of Christmas is, can we use this particular Christmas, this time of preparation, this Advent, to start listening to each other? Not just in this room, not just in our homes, but in the places that we work, the places that we experience, the grocery store, the shopping mall. Uh, and I would encourage you, there's more of these cards in the back. Drop one of these off at the counter at your local grocery store, at Kroger's, or at Starbucks, or at McDonald's, is a way to just offer that invitation to somebody. And more importantly, as we wrestle through a beginning of a new year, can we use this Advent to listen to God? Can we use this Advent to sort of pause and say, okay, God, what do you want from me? Just like the conversation we finished this morning downstairs in the Doll Dead talking about our mission footprints. And the question about what more yet needs to be done with the Rose House. I don't know. God knows. He's the one that's created provision and allowed us to come together. But can we listen? And can that be a common prayer for all of us as a church family? Is to listen to him and ask him, what would you have us do? And to think about what would you have us even do as a church as we think about the things that you've called us to be and be a part of. Can we use this Advent to listen to God? As we, uh, I just want to share another video here that maybe can help set this up in a different way to remind us of what the great story is. star illuminated a gathering of kings, shepherds, angels, and animals round a baby in a stable. It was the nativity, and it marked the end of a journey that began on a donkey's back. Whoa, hold up there, Jesus. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Your nativity. That's not exactly how it happened. Here, look, what's up with that donkey? Neither of the gospel stories mentions Mary traveling by donkey. And given the 60 miles of rough terrain they traveled, it's more likely they used a wagon. <laughs> Minor details. But then the innkeeper informs uh, them there's no room. Again, the Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper. And in the Greek, the word inn refers to an upper room in a house, not an actual motel. Oh, blast. Look, wherever it was, there was no room. So, Mary and Joseph were sent to the stable. Uh, no stable. <sighs> not in the Bible either. Now you're catching up. And in those days, most animals were typically kept in a cave. A cave? Yippers. So it could have been that instead of a stable, the Bible doesn't really say. And the Star of Bethlehem? Duh, that's biblical. Well, we're actually right for once. It's a Christmas miracle. Okay, so now came the shepherds and the three kings. No kings. Three kings is from the song. The Bible says magi, which means wise men. Three wise men? That works. Well, not so fast. While the Bible does mention three gifts, it doesn't specify the number of wise men that brought them. You mean there could have been more? Oh yeah, a whole prophecy even. With a crowd like that, it's a miracle the baby Jesus never cried. What, no crying he makes? That's just a lyric from Away in a Manger, not actual scripture. 
Well, of course he was crying. He just added a whole crowd of strange men. Eh, yes and no. There may have been many wise men, but they weren't there that night. You see? Okay, that's enough. Except for the blooming star of Bethlehem, you've just dismantled the most inspiring image of Christian tradition. So what's your point? Point? Well, I guess it's this. Even when all of the man-made traditions are stripped away, the eternal truths still remain. Whether they traveled by donkey or wagon, God brought them safely to the birthplace that was prophesied. Whether born in a stable or a cave, God provided shelter in a strange new land. Whether there were three kings, three wise men, or many, God called the elect to bear witness and testimony to the birth of a man. So whether your manger looks like this, or like this, the one thing that remains unchanged is this. A baby boy, born of a virgin, this day, in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Bless you, sir. I'll never look at the miracle of December 25th the same way again. December 25th? Oh, I almost forgot. Stop that! Music! D just that last time, apparently, if you didn't know, Christmas probably really actually happened like maybe September 11th. So just saying, we got it all wrong. But with that, let's get it all right. Stand up and join me in singing hymn number 33. It came upon a midnight clear. <laughs> 